Well, good morning. Um, as Dan mentioned, my name is Bill Pfeiffer, one of the pastors here at Eagle Creek Community Church. So glad that you're here with us this morning. And for those of you who are joining online, welcome. We, uh, we appreciate you being here. Uh, if you've joined us this morning for the first time, we're actually on the tail end. We're finishing up the series on the church. So we're actually into uh, part seven today. Um, I'm not going to take the time to, to go through what all we've covered. If you, if you would like, all of our teachings are uh, posted on our website, uh, audios, and then also the videos are, are saved out on our YouTube site. So uh, if you want to get caught up to, to where we are this morning, uh, it's been a really, really good series. Just, just to be reminded of this thing called the church. You know, Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not stand against her. And uh, that, that was true then, it's true today. Um, and in closing, we just thought uh, a good topic for us to cover is the mission. What is the mission of the church? And, uh, you know, perhaps we could have started the series with, with that topic, but we've chosen to end the series uh, um, about our mission. And uh, we've entitled the, uh, uh, t the message this morning uh, is On Mission. So before we get in, let's just go ahead and pray. God, we do just thank you for the church. We thank you that it is your body. Lord, that it's an army, that, um, Lord, we are your hands, your feet, your appendages. Lord, we are the ones who carry out the work that you've given. And, Lord, we just pray that this morning, just for these couple minutes that we spend looking in your word and, and just um, uh, pondering what it means to be on mission, what our mission is. God, I just pray that you would help us set aside the distractions, things that uh, would take our minds elsewhere, and help us, Lord, just to uh, be planted firmly and, and see what it is that your word says about this. And Lord, uh, may we all come away this morning changed people and people who um, better understand what it is that you have purposed for each of our lives. So we just commit our time together this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So to start out with, I like this summary that uh, gotquestions.org put together on the church. Let me read to you. It says, the church is a creation of God, Acts 20 and 1 Corinthians 3, founded and owned by Jesus Christ. He's the one that said, I will build my church. Matthew 16, verse 8, 18. Directed and energized by the Holy Spirit. We looked at that last week, the gifts of the Spirit, that, uh, that God, through the Holy Spirit, gives gifts to each member of the church to, uh, to help build the body. Therefore, it is the church's joy to look to God to explain his design for the church and his mission for it. God's mission for the church proves to have several parts. So, you know, if we're going to look at this area of mission, um, I think maybe the first place to start off is what is what was the mission of Jesus Christ himself. Anybody? What was Jesus' mission? Why did he come? Seek and save the lost. Yes. Good job. Anything else? Teach. Do his father's will. Make followers. Make followers. Everything you've said is, is right and good so far. Let's, let's look at John 17. And of course, this, uh, this section of the, of the scriptures, this is referred to as the high priestly prayer. 
So it's the end of Jesus' public ministry. He's, he's uh, uh, been in the upper room with the disciples for some time now. Um, they've been enjoying a meal together. And, uh, and perhaps the disciples are somewhat aware of what's going on, probably more oblivious than aware, as uh, a lot of times we are. But, uh, but Jesus has been teaching them, and now he goes uh, into what is referred to as the, the, um, the high priestly prayer. So I'll read in John chapter 17, verse 1. It says, When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him, and this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, who you have sent. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And of course, there's, there's much more that Jesus prays. He, he prays for the, the, the disciples. He prays for the church. He prays for uh, you and I in this, in this uh, section of Scripture. But he really summarizes his, his primary reason for being here is to introduce people to the Father. And how does that introduction come about? It comes through a relationship with Jesus Christ himself. So then, of course, we know that beyond this, Jesus, Jesus goes off. He's, uh, he's accused. Uh, he's tried. And then ultimately, he is, is judged and hung on a cross to die. And of course, we are excited to know that the story doesn't end there, that, that he rose from the, the grave, that he proved victorious over sin and death. He rose that we might have life. And, and that's what we celebrate as Christians. And so after his resurrection, he comes, he meets uh, his friends, his disciples, his followers. And we'll jump ahead to Matthew 28, verses 18 through 20. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. So the number one mission of the church is to make disciples. If you've been around this church for very long, you know that this is a, really kind of one of our primary, um, you know, hang our, hang our shingle out there statements. This is why we're, we're here. We're here to continue on the work of Jesus Christ. We're here to um, obey him. And we're here to make disciples. Now, disciples is one of those words that you're not going to hear too much outside of a Sunday morning, right? It's, it's a very religious word. It's always, uh, whenever people hear that word, it, it's in the context of, of church, typically. But if you think about it, what is a disciple? A disciple is a follower, a pupil. Somebody who is trying to emulate someone. And in fact, uh, I like this, this definition here. It says, <clears throat> a disciple is a follower, someone who attaches himself to his leader. Therefore, we reason, Jesus sent the church on its mission to acquaint people in every place with himself. As the church makes disciples, people would admire, worship, trust, follow, and obey Jesus Christ, their Savior and Lord. So Jesus started this process. He's the one who 
founded the church, uh, as, as we've learned over the last seven weeks. Christ is the head of the church, we're the body, and, uh, and, and we're to continue that work that he began um, at the cross. And so we're to make disciples, we're to make followers, we're, we're to preach the good news. We're to have an influence on those around us. Now, of course, we all know that you're never going <clears> to <throat> be able to force anybody to listen to you, to believe you, uh, to, uh, you know, you can't just go and, and, um, and make a disciple against their will. <laughs> it's something that they have to be being drawn by the Holy Spirit himself into a relationship. But uh, it's, it's very interesting that God chooses to work the way that he does. You know, he could have the clouds spell out John 3.16 and people would look up and go, wow, maybe I better open up a Bible and see what John 3.16 is. Um, <clears throat> there could be a numerous ways that God could share his truth with people. I find it very humbling to think that he uses us. That, we're, that we are his spokespeople, his, his uh, mouthpiece. So our first responsibility we see here, the first responsibility of the church is to make disciples. <clears throat> the second thing is that the church is to glorify Christ. 1 Timothy 3, 14 and 15 says this, I hope to come to you soon. But I am writing these things so that you, things to you, so that if I delay, you may know how one ought to behave in the household of God, <clears throat> which is the church of the living God, a pillar and buttress of the truth. So the, the church is to, to glorify or to reflect Christ. I like this uh, passage in, in Colossians 1 where Paul writes to, to the church there. He says, walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power, strengthened with all power according to his glorious might for all endurance and patience with joy giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us from the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. You know, it, if you think about it, the moon provides light in the evening, does it not? Have you ever, have you ever gone out on a um, night where there's a full moon and, you know, if, if, if the, you're out in the country or somewhere where there's not a lot of uh, ambient noise, uh, light noise, you can, you can be guided just by the, by the uh, light from the moon. But what is the source of the light from the moon? It's the sun. It's a reflection of the sun. It's not its own source. And so when we think about our Christian lives, we have to think of ourselves in, in the vein that we are the moon. We are a reflection of a relationship with Jesus Christ. And that, that illuminates the path that allows people to see and understand God more clearly. And, uh, and we ourselves, we have no light. We, we don't create light. We, ref we reflect light. And I think, um, you know, especially in this, in today, in this day and age, I'm sure some of you have heard or read some of the um, statistics from the Barna Group. Uh, if you're not familiar with them, they, they are... Um, a, a group, I think they were started in 1984. They do a lot of research, a lot of um, different surveys 
of just where the church is culturally in, in the United States. And I don't think, you know, it should come to anybody as a surprise to anybody that, that church attendance in recent years, it's declining. Uh, Christianity is becoming less and less uh, influential in our country and, and perhaps in the world a, a, as well. And uh, unfortunately, the, the trends are not going in, in the, uh, the, the right direction. Uh, but one of the things that Barna uh, does, and I, I didn't, I, I read over a study, I didn't, didn't really have enough information to publish anything, but, but basically one of the, the findings that they've seen in the last 10 years is, is part of the decline, part of the reason why churches are, are declining in attendance and just in general becoming less relevant, uh, especially to the, to the uh, younger population, uh, there's this, this problem of hypocrisy. What is hypocrisy? Hypocrisy is saying one thing, but yet having a life that demonstrates something else. And so, you know, to use my moon analogy, uh, this is not a full moon. This is a, a, a partially hidden moon like we had yesterday. I guess we couldn't see it here because the, uh, the, the uh, sky, we had an eclipse, especially seen in the southwest part of our country. But if, if you think about it, if the moon is reflecting light, if we're to reflect light, that light should draw people back to Jesus. If our lives don't back up, what we say we believe, what's that going to do? It's going to just turn people the other direction. And then oftentimes, I, I remember in my days on, on uh, campus as we were sharing the gospel with, with students, that often became an excuse. Well, I don't go to church because there's a bunch of hypocrites. And, uh, and usually my answer to that was, well, if you find a perfect church, then don't go to it because it won't be perfect anymore. You know, that's just the way things are. We, we are still humans. We are still in the flesh. We still struggle. And uh, as uh, Belinda and Michelle and I were reminding each other a couple nights ago, that's part of the reason why Jesus is constantly interceding for us. Thank the Lord for that. Um, we, we are humans. We are going to make mistakes. But this, this passage here and throughout all of the New Testament would show that if we've put our trust in Christ and if we are living our lives the way that God wants us to, to live, that we should see a, a pattern of obedience, a pattern of um, a change occurring in such a way that our lives should be something that people would say, wow, what is it that you have? Because I want some of that. Um, unfortunately, not, not all of us uh, not in, in a lot of the Christian world that claims to be Christian, uh, their lives are not always consistent with that. Again, going back to gotquestions.org, I like, I like the way they put this. It says, Christ designate, or designed his church to represent his supernatural, life-saving work to the world. In his church, Christ shows to the world what a freed and forgiven people can be. People who are satisfied with God as the real result of Christ's joyful triumphant self-sacrifice. He has planned the church's values to be his values. He expects its lifestyle to reflect his character. 2 Corinthians, Ephesians, Colossians, and 1 Timothy. So Christ, his desire, his hope for us as individuals and us as a church is that we reflect the tr his true nature, that we be that full moon that, that lights the path to those around us. And then thirdly, the mission of the church 
is to build his body. Ephesians 2, 19 through 22 says this, So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the, the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the, the cornerstone in whom the whole structure being joined together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. So that's, that's where we, we kind of come, come back together, right? We, we realize these truths in the, in the Scripture. We realize what, what God desires us to become. And then he also realizes we can't do it on our own. We need each other. We need to be a part of, of, a, of a body. Jesus is the cornerstone, but the building of, of the uh, church is being built upon himself and upon his, his truths. In 2 Corinthians 13, Paul writes in the closing of this, of this letter to the Corinthian church, he says, Finally, brothers, rejoice. Aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints greet you. So this is, this is kind of the, the life mission then of, of us as Christians and of the church until we go to be with glory is, is we're to, to, to bind together. We're to grow together. We're to encourage one another. We're to admonish one another. We're to correct each other if we need correction. Um, that's, that's what the body does. And in doing so, we make ourselves a reflection of Jesus Christ. And one that hopefully those outside of the faith will look at and say, gosh, I, I want to know more. I want to hear about this relationship that you have with Jesus Christ. You know, and here at Eagle Creek, we're, there's a lot of different ways that, that we do this. Uh, you know, there's, there's part of a reason why we're a smaller congregation, because we really want to connect with each other. You know, we don't want to just be kind of out, out in the shadows, out in the uh, outskirts, but we really want to be involved in, in each other's lives. Uh, we would love to get involved with you in, in your life if, if you're not necessarily dug in as, as, as well as, as you could and should be. We have uh, growth groups. These are accountability groups, uh, usually one-on-one -on -one or, you know, maybe groups of four or five people. They get together to pray, to uh, read the word together, to challenge each other, to encourage each other, to talk about our struggles, to talk about uh, difficulties that we're going through. Iron sharpens iron, so one man, one woman sharpens another. We also have uh, life groups that get together, uh, and these are larger groups that typically meet outside of Sunday mornings. Uh, we go through Bible study together. We uh, may have a, a group based on uh, a, a different uh, age point that we are in life or just a particular study that we're going through in, in the scriptures. Um, other things that, that we have going on with uh, classes outside of, of Sunday morning. Of course, we have a Greek class that just got started. Um, New Testament Greek will be meeting tomorrow night. So if uh, any of you are interested in learning more about that, uh, we can talk to you afterwards. Our professor is here in the room today. So thanks for being here, Paul. Um, but we also have our Sunday morning uh, Sunday school classes and uh, just other ways that we can get together to encourage each other and just to grow in our faith together. Um, I think one of the, the most important things is we all realize that, you know, that the moment that we came to Christ, wouldn't it be wonderful if just the old nature and everything about us just completely disappeared and we woke up and we're just a brand new person? I mean, in some cases, I know some of your testimonies it was very much like that. Uh, but for, for most of us, I would say that 
that to walk in the in the Christian life it just it's it's a day by day decision we get up in the morning we look at ourselves in the mirror and say I choose to follow Christ I choose to put others needs ahead of mine and uh, and so that's where we really need each other to uh, uh, to help each other grow and, and pursue so with that let's uh, let's just look to the Lord in prayer God we do thank you that um, that you give us each other you give us the church um, and Lord thank you that you ultimately paid the price that we deserved to pay Lord that your your death and your resurrection was sufficient that um, because of that we're able to be in relationship with you and with the Father and Lord I just pray for all of us that you would uh, help us to uh, walk in a manner worthy of the gospel Lord that we would be a reflection of your truth to the world that is just uh, struggling and, and needing to be in relationship with you. And we just uh, commit the rest of our morning to you and, and thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen.